He's Henry Gomez, an ad agency strategist with over 28 years of experience. And he's Howard Eibach, a former copywriter and creative director and the author of two books on the creative brief. And together, we're the Brief Brothers. We love talking about creative briefs, briefing, and advertising. Well, Howard, we're back with another episode. And as you'll see in a minute, um, we had an interesting conversation with Julian Cole, Julian is a career strategist, um, has worked at some big agencies, most notably BBH. Uh, he'll tell us about that. And Julian has now a enterprise called Strategy Finishing School, where he trains uh, strategists. So let's take a look. Well, Howard, we're back with another episode and joining us today is Julian Cole. Uh, Julian is someone I'm excited to get to know a little better. Um, if you're in advertising and strategy circles on LinkedIn and social media, you've no doubt seen Julian and his content on uh, strategy briefs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he runs something called Strategy Finishing School. Um, but I'm interested to learn more about his background um, and where uh, he started his career, how he got into strategy, and and how he has now arrived uh, to the point to really being a strategy trainer and, and mentor. So, Julian, welcome to the Brief Brothers. Um, and if you want to start there and, and just give us a little bit of your background. Yeah, excited to be chatting briefs and all things brief. So, my uh, past in history into advertising was my... Mum was a massive influence on me. She was always pestering me in university that I needed to go get internships. In Australia, internships are just not a thing. I feel like America, everyone is motivated to get the next job. No one goes and does internships. So uh, when I was at school, I was studying psychology, management, marketing. And when I was doing that, I did a couple of internships at different areas. And one was at a digital marketing agency called Sputnik. And I went in there as an account executive and account executive intern. And I did trend reports, which I loved. I was like, if someone's paying you for a job to just look up what's cool on the internet, this was probably 2006. I was saying, this, this is the best job ever. I love this industry. <laughs> and I was doing that. And it was quite interesting because two things that I think have been really influential in my career. At the time I was doing those trend reports, I decided to start a blog and pretty much talk about what I was finding in those trend reports. And I think that has had a significant impact on my career, which I'll get to um, at the end. But the other side of that, my professional career, I was in that office at a digital agency, loving it, thinking this is where I want to be. And in there, to the side of the office, there was a small satellite. Um, there was one room and it was another agency. It was a satellite office for this agency and it was called Nature Communications. And they were communication strategists. That's all they did. And I remember asking my account director, I was like, who are those people in the other room? I was always interested because they kind of had a bit of a quirky look to them. They just had the whiteboards out. They didn't look like the creatives. And they told me uh, they're strategists. Uh, and at that time, I was like, all I knew of strategy was uh, playing chess and then Age of Empires. And uh, loved Age of Empires as a game. And I thought, oh, this is really interesting. And I went in there and the first person I met would be my eventual first boss was Adam Ferrier, who, is, who was a criminal psychologist who became a consumer psychologist. And he introduced me to Naked. And I did my first, I was the editor of the university newspaper. And I asked him, could I interview you? It just sounds so interesting. And after the end of the interview, I asked, hey, I actually would love to do an internship for you. Would you let me come on board? So I did my internship there. And Naked Communications is a really interesting agency uh, and a point of time, I think, in the advertising, the evolution of advertising. So they were offering something which was uh, media neutral ideas and communication strategy neutral. So what they were saying was if your advertising agency does your communication strategy, they will want to make TV ads because that's all they know how to make. If your media agency does it, they'll just go to wherever the commissions are. W what you need is an agency in the middle that will just come up with the idea, 
where it's neutral of media and find the best place for that idea to come to life. Now, this took a hold in Australia and England, I would say the two big, they, two big kind of places they grew from. I think America, they tried, it just didn't have as much impact. But they introduced me to communication strategy and comms planning. And uh, that agency was just so hot at the time. Now, the hottest agency in Australia um, doing amazing work for Coca-Cola, um, winning massive awards. And everyone was looking at them because they're like, these are this great agency. And they're coming up with ideas and they had these amazing offices as well. And so I internship there, there. But I was also someone who really loved university still. So I stayed at university and did a thesis on the uses and gratifications of Facebook. So it was a thesis on social media and the first one to be published in Australia on social media. So it was a bit of a, um, a big case that I ended up getting a lot of national kind of PR around it because people were interested it, my thesis started on MySpace and then it ended on Facebook because it was that year. Around, that around, what, around what year was this? 2007. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, that's early days for yeah. Facebook. Um, it's it's hard to re imagine or remember now that at that time it, it wasn't nearly as penetrated into the public psyche as it is today. In fact, right. I think I have my, my account goes back to 2008 maybe. So yeah. And isn't uh, two thousand seven like when the iPhone forever? Isn't isn't yeah. isn't the wasn't the iPhone introduced in two thousand seven? It was around there probably, seven eight. It was around there. That I think yeah. that's when I got my first one or boxy version of it. But that was massive. So what they decided to do was uh, Naked wanted to spin off a social media agency. So I ended up being one of the founding members of uh, Australia's first social media agency. Um, media marketing agency. So it was really new territory back then and a massive role for, um, obviously I was just one of the strategists, but there was only three of us on the team and they span out this company, which was called The Population. And it was way too early in the game for social media marketing. Like no one was buying it. And they had had, they bought in some pretty heavy hitters in the industry to start this agency. Um, and then I was there too. Um, who was not a heavy hitter, but ha had the knowledge and could kind of put it together. And so that was my first experience. And that kind of didn't go so well. And then I moved in Australia to another agency, which was a digital production agency called The Conscience Organisation, another smaller agency. And their whole shtick was, we're not a big agency. We've got directors, producers and editors in-house. So any job you want to make, client, come to us and we'll execute the idea. So it was falling under the radar of the big agencies and they found their little spot where they could just go direct to client and they had big clients on their books of Nestle, Coca-Cola and um, Foster's Beer and all the beers in there. And the founder saw it as an opportunity because he said, I, I've got client contacts. Social media is this new thing. If I can put the two together. And so I was brought on to kind of sell in social media strategy at the very beginning and we did some amazing campaigns there um, but it was very grassroots kind of social media marketing agency that was kind of when I was like oh this is great I was in Sydney a new city I was born in Melbourne moved to Sydney for the job and then I was like I want to move to New York I want to go to the big leagues and that's when I moved um, to BBH I was lucky enough to get a job pretty early in the piece there and probably didn't understand um, how big a deal BBH was in terms of strategy and creative expertise. I just saw the brands that they were working with. They were like Sprite, Axe, Johnny Walker. I was like, I'd love to work on those brands and was lucky enough to get in the door. However, I'd say at that moment, um, I was a self-taught strategist up to that point. And here I am walking into one of the hallowed strategy agencies in uh, North America and in London, you know, they were known for their strategy. And I felt like a complete fraud imposter there. I was a, got a strategy director, digital strategy director title, but I just, it was eating me up inside. I was like not sleeping very well, um, just completely nervous around everyone. And for a year, I just didn't tell anyone. And then I told my boss, I was like, hey, I 
I've never been taught strategy properly. And that's when I got my fundamental training in strategy. And I, I really see that as a pivotal moment in my career because I was about to plateau. I think a lot of strategists internalize and they're like, oh, I never got the proper training. So I'm not as good as these other strategists. I'm going to get found out as a fraud or any of this. Um, and their imposter syndrome holds them back. But as you two will know, it's like confidence is the key to strategy. We're, we're dealing in a subjective art. You have to, there's multiple routes. There's no one right route. And so you need confidence. And without that confidence, you're not going to be any good. So I was lucky enough to work there. Um, made my way up to head of communications planning. Um, off the back of a couple of wins, uh, we won PlayStation and I kind of launched the PlayStation uh, 4. It's like the highest grossing um, PlayStation video game launch in history. And so we won the Xbox PlayStation battle. Xbox was ahead there and then we flipped it to PlayStation being back on top. So that was one of my career highlights. And then after that, I moved to BBDO and set up their communications or grew their communications planning department from four to 17 um, comm strategists there and worked on Super Bowl campaigns, worked to some great work for Bacardi. This um, was in New York as well? Yeah, all in New York. So that I went to the head of communications planning at both those agencies. I then took a, a, a year sabbatical and my wife and I decided to move to LA and she works in music and I thought, oh, this would be good. And I really wanted to get a job in tech, um, kind of a scale up tech and do strategy that side. Put the feelers out, crickets, absolutely <laughs> no one picking up the phone. Um, so I started freelancing in that time. And when I was freelancing, um, it, it just stuck, the work just started coming in really easily and ended up doing some of the iconic brands that I really wanted to work for in the first place. So I ended up consulting to Facebook, Apple, Disney, Uber, and doing projects as a consultant there. And one of the things that I constantly got requested was training. They were just like, we need to train, train other strategists. They knew I'd done training in the past. Uh, so they wanted me to come in and help scale up and train their departments. So I, that was really easy for me. I, I always lo have loved doing that and have found a passion in that and teaching others about strategy. So I was doing that. And the other thing that I realized was my journey of being that self-taught strategist with the crippling imposter syndrome was not only me. It wasn't me. The 95% of strategists I'd say out there are self-taught strategists. They've never had that foundational training. So that really spurred the idea of the strategy finishing school. And I take it all the way back to the very beginning there because the blog was really a key for me as well, because putting your opinions out online takes, uh, you know, pressing that publish button, as you two would know, it, it, it feels disgusting. It, you like the anxiety rises in you and you kind of get sweaty palms, but then after a while you get used to it. But it also makes you feel like if you've got a, put your name to something, you really think something through. And I was one of the first, um, I got invited to teach on Skillshare in like 2011 um, when they had really good splits of equity uh, or revenue share. Now it's like you get $2 if you tell a thousand people or whatever. Um, but back then I was able to, I taught a course in digital strategy and I remember how much of an improvement I had in my skill set once I had to teach it. Um, cause I just knew digital strategy from my gut. I didn't know how to actually talk about it. And that was a massive moment for me and gave me confidence. And so when I, uh, in 2019, when I was consulting, I felt confident enough that I had enough knowledge now to teach, um, strategy kind of end to end and give that fundamental training and that lucky training that I got that really changed my career. I was able to give that again. So wow. a couple of things I wanted to react to. The the first is the whole, and I know I've noticed, and this was you actually ticked off one of the things I wanted to ask you about was I noticed a lot of your kind of uh, snackable content that you put out there to promote your strategy finishing school is about imposter syndrome. And I wanted to talk to you about that, but you already kind of ticked that off. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I agree with you as 
a person I started and our listeners, anybody who's listened to more than a few episodes of our of our show knows my story. But, uh, you know, I started an ad agency with I walked through the door the first day without ever having contemplated what went on in an ad agency. And I did all kinds of odd jobs. And uh, within about four years, I kind of found this world of strategy. And we were a small boutique agency and we didn't have a strategy department. I, so I kind of established it, but I didn't know I was like, you know, teaching myself as I went along. Um, so um, definitely the idea of like, you know, there's this permeating thought of there's other people that have been doing this for a lot longer that are a lot smarter than you. Um, how can you, how, how, how smart are you to figure it out and, and, you know, go to stand in front of a client and say they should do this or they should do that. So I, I definitely re relate to that idea over time, you know, and it's been 20 years since I started. Um, over time, you realize, you know, clients aren't necessarily and usually not very much more informed or trained than you are. Um, and so at this point, you know, it, over time, but I wanted to go back to a question when you went to your boss at BBH and said, look, I've got this problem and he, and, and I need to get training. What training did you do? Like, what did he recommend? Was it something internal? Was it external resources? How did you, uh, how did you go about like filling that gap for yourself? Yeah. So luckily I was at one of the best uh, agencies or the best people I've worked with in strategy. So I was lucky enough to just have a really great group of people around me who I could learn from. And I feel like it was more picking their brains and going through decks with them and, and having more than more time to kind of really analyze and um, what they were doing and, and, and getting them to step me through it step by step. And it's so interesting. It was, kind of, yeah. it was kind of giving yourself permission to probe these people at a level that you had not been before about how they were thinking and how they were solving uh, their challenges. Yeah. And I think the vulnerability is the hard thing. Just kind of putting, once you put your hand up and say, Hey, I don't, uh, I feel well, really I, I, over, um, over water, underwater here. Yeah. I'd like to really <clears throat> explore that Julian, because um, I think there are others out there, there are lots of others out there who feel the same way and don't know how to raise their hand or are terrified about raising their hand. And you had to wonder in the back of your mind, if I raise my hand, am I going to be out the door? Yeah. What, what, sure. what was the, what, I mean, the response obviously was you got the training you needed, but what did your boss say when you confessed, when you, when you, they were, would, when you were, they were just, they were just like, this, is, this is everyone. This, they, they, like, you're not alone here. And this, this happens. And also, I think it was an understanding of why he hired me as well. Mm. And he hired me because of the campaigns that I've done in the past, which was um, more digital strategy, more comm strategy, connection strategy, putting all the pieces together for really interesting integrated social and digital work, which is something they didn't have. And so it kind of took me a while to realize he wasn't trying to make me another brand strategist he's got really strong brand strategists there what i'm bringing is a new skill and it, it's emerging but it's still really valuable and so i think understanding that had really helped a little bit and knowing and knowing i still had some value to give to the table because the other thing was when i before i moved to bbh i'd never had a creative department mm -hmm. which is wild like there were no I'd never written a creative brief because the agency was really small or I was the creatives and then the directors and producers and editors would then go make the ideas happen. So it was a really weird like a reckoning when I came to um, America and started working with them. I'm like, I'm not used to this. And I tried to pretend like I'd written all these creative briefs before, but I hadn't, <laughs> I hadn't. Yeah. Um, but I had a massive skill, which definitely comes from my days at Naked and then led on as I learned social and as much. It's like now what I can clearly see is I had so much value around comms frameworks, campaign ecosystems, tying all the pieces together, really thinking about integrated campaigns, which the strategy, the rest of the strategists weren't as strong as, weren't as skilled in. 
but their skill in brand strategy or writing creative briefs was 10 times mine. And so I think that really helped. But I, that, and I guess for me, the whole, the thing that held me back was the feeling of being a fraud and I was the only one like, oh no, mm. I'm going to get found out. And so mm. I think that's why I bang the drum so hard on, hey, here's someone at the, you know, uh, f fairly far into their career, very, se I would say seasoned, um, but you're not alone. You're not alone. Like there's so many of us here and I can say I was in those shoes. And so that's why I constantly try to say that because in my head, I didn't think like that. I thought everyone else had a special book or a special, like, <laughs> you know, the, the secret herbs and spices. And I was the one who had to just kind of like peer over and get it. And it's not the case. Well, well, the, the, the advantage that I had, Julian, is that I just simply said, I've never written a brief before and I don't write briefs. I'm the guy you write the brief for. So I had to, I just said, I'm stupid. I don't know what is a good brief. You, you meaning account people or strategists or whoever was responsible for the creative brief, you are handing me this document and expecting me to hit a home run every time. And I don't know good from mediocre from bad. And I just yeah. realized I have to figure out what's the difference. So I went to school. I talked to people. I read articles. I read books. And my, I mean, it, it wasn't that I I was a fraud. I felt like I was a fraud. I just didn't know. I just came right out and said, I don't know, but I have to know because I'm working from these documents that you're giving me. And I have to, I have to do well, whether it's a blank document or 15 pages. And I'm looking for that nut, that little nugget in the middle. So it's really interesting that I hear you talk about this imposter syndrome because I never felt that, but it's not that I don't deny that it exists. It's just that I came, yeah. I mean, I look at it from the, the, the perspective I look at it is from, I had, I knew a high school diving coach that a really good friend of mine uh, was his, he was, he was his uh, pupil and this diving coach coached him to two state championships. He was a math teacher, was overweight and had never dove in his life. But he wow. knew the mechanics of diving well enough and was articulate enough that he could communicate to my my buddy how to do this, that, and the other thing and helped. Well, he had some natural ability, but that's kind of the way I feel. I'm I'm the diving coach who's never dove a day in his life. I don't write briefs. I've written a couple, yeah. but I know how to explain it because I've heard it from really smart people. And, and I've learned a ton from Henry just from the last three years of this show getting inside his head, hearing what he has to say about how he writes the briefs. And, not, and I steal from him all the time and use it <laughs> in my, in my, in my workshops. My, 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 fa my saving is amateurs plagiarize professional steal. So I steal. Yeah. So be careful. I'm going to take some of your ideas here, Julian, and bring them into my workshops. But, take them, please. <laughs> but, but what I, what I admire, what I admire about this part of the conversation is the fact that you just, you say, look, I don't know. And I need to know because yeah. I, I said the same thing, but from a different perspective. And so uh, uh, just a couple of points. One is, um, you know, having felt that imposter syndrome, having been, you know, I was well into my career in advertising and in strategy before I had a boss that was actually a strategist. Like my mm -hmm. boss was never a strategist. I was working at small agencies. And I think that having worked at small full service agencies, and done, worn a lot of hats, especially in the early years before I got into strategy, helped me a lot. And I, I really feel for young strategists who maybe join a big agency as like a junior strategist right out of college, because they're kind of in this silo, one track, and they don't necessarily see the, the business as a business, the advertising business as, you know, and I got to see that. I got to see the back office operations. I got to see accounts, how that works. I got to see creative, how that works, uh, traffic and production and how that works. And so then I saw, I naturally saw where the gap was, which was strategy at that, at that first agency. Um, but we are always lamenting the lack of formal training that exists in advertising today. Mm -hmm. The small agencies don't have the resources and the big agencies have the resources, but they frankly have decided not to offer them anymore. I want to believe like in the 70s and 80s, there was a lot more, um, uh, you know, set up formalized training within at least the big agencies. 
None of that stuff exists. I mean, I've worked now at, you know, four of the major holding companies. I've worked at Publicis, Omnicom, IPG, uh, and now WPP. And the truth is there just isn't a, a ton of uh, formal training within, right? So you have to be kind of that self-starter going out there. And that's how I met Howard. You know, uh, Howard put out a book, How to Write an Inspired Creative Brief. And I found it on Amazon. And I said, well, I've been doing this for 15 years, but let me give it a, let me look at the book because maybe there's something I can learn from, from that. And that's how, and it hit off a friendship that now I, I want to say probably close to 15 years that, that, that we've been friends and a podcast for, for, for three years. So the other thing I wanted to go back to was you mentioned a, a very peculiar moment in time, which was when social media was emerging and people really didn't know what to do with it. Like mm -hmm. there was mm -hmm. no clear road forward. Um, I remember Mark Ritson did a speech to the, the AANA, the Australian ANA, um, like in 2016 about the, the traditional digital divide. And at that time, this was every, everything that brands were doing in social media was organic. There was no, this, the, the entire environment has changed radically. And it's a good reminder here for people that this environment that we're working in in 2024 is not the environment of eight years ago of, tw of 2016. Um, where everything was, you know, people were putting these large staffs on this and there was really no reach for any of anything that was being done because the revenue models for the social media companies hadn't been fully fleshed out yet. They were all startups that um, were burning through cash. They weren't making money, right? Um, and then ultimately they needed to figure out how to do it. And in a way, I think traditional media has bent toward digital media and digital media has bent toward traditional media. So if you look at Facebook now, if you want to play, you got to pay, you know, if you want to reach these large audiences that are on Facebook or Instagram, you, you have to pay because just putting up something organically ain't going to do it. So I, I also find that whole thing fascinating. Um, and part of me is very skeptical when there's a new technology and everybody is like pulling their hair out and saying, this is going to change everything and we're going to blah, blah, blah. And our industry loves that narrative of this is going to be dead and this is going to be everything moving forward. And the truth is, it's it's not that way. Our our quiver of arrows is growing. Um, you know, I, 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 I want to say terrestrial AM, FM radio is still like in America, at least, is still one of the highest reach mediums that, that exists. And that's like the most unsexy medium there is, but it's very effective, right? And it has its place. It has its advantages. So um, I don't know if you have any thoughts just kind of on the ongoing pace of change in our industry and the, the doomsayers that, that seem to think that yesterday is dead and tomorrow is going to be completely different. I, I uh, yeah, have definitely feel like I've gone through the evolution and it was even interesting to do with the role of communication strategy or comms planning when the world becomes more complex or the media channels become more complex the need for comms strategy grows when everything starts to consolidate down and you set a point in time there which is quite interesting 2016 I see that as consolidating down we go to Amazon Meta Google you know, everything's consolidating down. The need for comm strategy is not as big because the the brand strategist should hopefully be able to understand all the pieces. But come 2008, when there was new channels coming out everywhere, websites were still very confusing. And, you know, every brand had their own website and massive investment of money going in there. There was a real need for comm strategy. And so it actually ebbs and flows based on how difficult the media landscape gets. Uh, I definitely have seen a transition now from 2017 to 2023. That definitely feels like now um, it's all interest-based. Where you would build a following and you could obviously use that following and get um, 
you know, you'd, you'd know you'd get a certain number of views like that, that when we're talking about probably more um, smaller brands and stuff, they knew they could get views because they'd grown a certain audience and influencers as well. Now what I'm seeing is it's all interest-based graph, interest-based algorithm, which is like, it's no longer, and this is really interesting. It's no longer showing you your friends. Like if you go onto Instagram, your friends are not there where five years ago, that was all your friends' pictures and everyone was there. Now you go onto your feed and same with Twitter and all these other platforms because they're copying what happened on TikTok. They're just showing you the most engaging content and bring that to the algorithm. And so then it actually makes it really interesting as a content creator who's probably on the smallest, you know, like I'm not a big brand. So sorry, I'll, I'll caveat that. I'm taking it out of the brand world and probably into the creator influencer world. It, it's totally different even to the way I'm creating content now. Like you put out a whole ton more volume. Like to me, it's more of a volume game now than what it was before, um, which is really interesting um, in itself because I would have never thought we were going to volume. I thought we were going to quality where it's now quantity. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you still, it's yeah, funny you still have to, go, go ahead, Henry. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, you do have to put out a lot of free stuff to get the attention um, because that's what keeps people, that's what helps keep people at the top of mind. Um, Particularly yeah. if you're if you're not putting money behind it, right? Like if you're yeah. if you're a small guy, you're trying to you're trying to, and you have a niche audience because that that I mean, if you're in your case, Julian, you're teaching strategy. That's like a pinprick, uh, you know, in the world in terms of yes. people that's relevant to and that that care about it. Um, so. Uh, it, on the one hand, it's great because these people are reachable. They're on these social media channels. But on the other hand, you're competing for attention with, you know, brands and things that have massive budgets and that have far greater, I guess, lifestyle and and um, cultural implications than your very specialized niche area. Yes, sorry. And I should have caveated that as well, because this is an advice I'd be giving to a brand of a multi-million dollar brand, but more of my own reflection of my experience with social media too. Yeah. Well, I too want to go back to something you'd said earlier in your in your tr career trajectory, because it rings a bell with me and it's and I want to explore it. You said that in Australia and the UK, uh, more so than the United States, there was a tendency to uh, look at the idea ahead of the media, whereas the media, we rush out and, and we buy media before we even know what the idea is. And it's always, it's been a point of contention for me as a, someone who teaches brief writing and someone who is a creative who teaches brief writing, because my philosophy has always been idea first, tactic second. One of the questions I get all, all the time when I teach brief writing is, why do the briefs that you're showing us as good examples have no deliverables? Where are the deliverables? And Henry and I have talked about this a lot. And I and I and I just throw it right back at the people in my workshops. Well, you, you tell me why are there no deliverables on here? And we have that discussion, and it's someone eventually wakes up and says, "Oh, well, creatives don't need to know the deliverables. Come up with an idea." So that's that's essentially it. Even though we still live in the world, media media um, percentages no longer help pay the bills. That's been that's been dead for decades. But media still drives a lot of of what a project is going to be, and it's not idea first, tactic second. What are your thoughts on that? Is 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 that something that's top of mind for you, or is that just we got to deal with it? It's the way of the world. Uh, I think I think it's definitely so. I believe that that's not going to change um, because if you look at uh, if you look at a marketing budget, 90% of it is going to media, 10% is going to production. So if I put myself in the shoes of the marketer who doesn't want to get fired, your allocation of 90% of your shares, if you know, if we we're putting 90% of our shares into the share market and 10% into crypto, that's the crazy creatives who might 10x our, um, our investment. I think you want to go the short bet. And the fact is the way the media industry works is upfronts. They're trying to like sell you, get you slotted in so they can use that money um, to invest it in other things. They want that upfront money and, and to be locked away. So I can't imagine a world where we're going to 
uh, go around for uh, move around from up front. I can tell you, I agree. I was completely frustrated my whole career when, you know, I come from learning, like being indoctrinated at Naked, where it's like idea first, idea first. It's always about the idea. Don't even talk about the media. Then to be like cold water the face. That's that's great. That's great in your fairy tale world, but in reality, that's never happening. Um, we've locked in the budget. And where I ended up was 80% of the media budget will always be locked. 20% will be open for you to flex into the idea. And so when I talk about com strategy, I always tell the team, it's always about where, where do we make that idea come to life to help what media environments can help bring that idea to life that will get it more scale and like line it up and um, implement it. So for instance, um, there was a great example for Swell, the reusable water bottles, you know, uh, recyclable water bottles. They did a whole campaign. They surrounded the moments when people started feeling guilty about using water bottles. And one of theirs was in um, at the front of cafes on the bins in New York City because that's where you chuck your disposable coffee cup and you see all the rubbish there. That's when you feel the guilt. They did it in the timing was perfect. It was 2000, you know, the start of the new year it was in January. So that wasn't the major part of the buy. I think the major part of the buy was in subway stations, but that's the stuff that people recognized or picked up on and, and really brought that idea to life and brought the creativity through to the media channel as well. So, uh couple of points there. One is getting back to like the the industry and and one of the my pet peeves is the jargon and and you didn't say the words but at one point media agnostic was like the big like everybody was saying that but the reality was and and, and what you're saying and I agree is there's the theory behind right like idea first and then there's the practical reality and the practical you know you mentioned upfronts but it's also you know, in the Mad Men days, in the early 60s, a lot of the clients were privately held companies that could have a long-term view. Now everything is publicly held. There's a budgeting cycle, right? So it's not just the media that wants the money up front. The, the CFOs need to know what they're going to be spending in advance and, and where it's going. So all these things kind of have to get locked in. And then you have the agencies that have voluntarily split the creative function from the media function, right? And created these large media buying um, conglomerates. Um, and so by the time a creative brief gets written, all of this stuff, most of it, to your point, 80% of it is already in stone. And the creative department has now just become a vendor that yeah. is mm -hmm. making widgets to fill orders that mm -hmm. have already been placed. I, I don't know. I, I I know I was just pontificating. Do you have a reaction <laughs> to that or? No, no, I, I agree. I think that's, yeah. that's the reality of the situation that we're in. But to me, um, strategy has always been working with the limited resources you've got. I've actually just read a book on Alexander the Great. Um, amazing book. It's like written like a fiction book. So it's not like too dry. And it was just amazing because I think of him, uh, you know, we'd say maybe one of the best war strategists of all time, kind of conquered all the world in 10 years. But the thing that stood out to me reading this book was the amount of politics and infighting in his own team. He's, mm -hmm. you know, he had to take on his all his dad's old cronies, like all the corrupt people in Macedonia in the army. He took them on and had to take them to battle. He had no Navy. And at that stage, they're like, you can't win battles without a Navy and an army, a land force. You needed both. And he had a very weak Navy. And after a while, he just cut, cut his losses and went. And to me, it, it, it reminds me, it's kind of water the face again of just like strategy is dealing with limited resources. There's no perfect, you know, like ideal world. And we do have these handcuffs on when we we talk about creative campaigns yet yeah, we're never going to be idea agnostic there's always going to be limitations there's always going to be the banners you have to make for the client there's always going to have to be a shopper tactic no we don't have enough money to make a times square billboard 
come to life, you know, like, so um, that was just another reminder. I was like, oh, he's, I thought I was going to read a different book. I thought I was going to be like, this guy had everything under control. No, it was a complete shambles too. Yeah, that's a really interesting analogy. I've read a lot about Alexander the Great myself. He's a fascinating character and, and you know, a guy in his 20s who could corral so many different personalities and challenges and, like you said, conquer the world in a decade. Uh, is strategy, in your in your view, is strategy... Um, emerging is it growing is it becoming more prevalent and important or is it a constant battle to to hold the ground that you believe it it needs to maintain in our industry i honestly feel like i haven't seen much change over the 15 coming up to 20 years i've been in it i haven't i haven't seen enough monumental change in how strategy is approached i feel like I, it would be great to see our departments growing I, I don't feel like they are. Um, I think they're staying the same size, which to me, I would say is, I know the rough retainer is around eight to 20% or 20% on the very high side of how much of the um, retainer is taken by strategy. I would say it has to stay the same. Um, I can't see it going too much bigger than that. I think, you know, in creative agency agencies specifically, so I'd say we're still fighting for our seat at the table. The I, I think the quality of strategy varies so vastly. Uh, I, I see it in, you know, I see a lot of strategy portfolios. I see a lot of strategy decks. And I can tell you the quality is, the variance is very, very high. And so I think that's, a, that's an issue. That's definitely, that's definitely got to be an issue. And, and definitely something I noticed at BBDO. When I was at BBDO, one of the biggest jobs for me was actually dealing with um, account leads coming to me and saying, I want that strategist off the account because they're, they're no good. They're no mm -hmm. good. That was like weekly, me mediating, shuffling my team around because someone was battling or the quality wasn't as good. And so the consistency of a strategy product output that that is the real challenge, and I think I I can't see that getting fixed anytime soon. Like obviously, there's stuff like what we do, which is education. I think education might be becoming easier to access, and maybe if there is an area where I see like a silver lining, I, I would say in some emerging markets, um, West Africa comes to mind. I know like there's a lot of Nigerians, um, a lot of Kenyans that I often see, um, Vietnamese, uh, they're, the, they're the countries I constantly see strategists coming from and they're growing strategy as a discipline in their country. Um, and I think that's the that's the exciting place. And those and those markets are growing, so they need to. I think um, I think it's growing there, but that might just be that the size of the market's growing and and maturing. One of the things, and as you were saying, you know, you review decks and there's a big variance. So obviously there's some strategic product that is inferior. And I I just like, like reflexively thought, if Julian saw my decks, what would he think? <laughs> so that's, and, and one of the things that popped into my mind is that sometimes these strategy decks are not. I mean, they're always a reflection of the strategist, but they're also somehow a reflection of the client, right? If the client isn't sophisticated, a lot of times the strategy can't be that sophisticated because you will go right over the, the, the client's head. And that's one of the challenges that I see a lot in. And I, I work in a specific area of advertising. I work at a Hispanic agency, so multicultural advertising in the United States. And Honestly, a lot of the clients I've had over the years aren't necessarily trained marketers. They're people that came from other parts of the company, of the client company. They might have been in operations or, and they're not necessarily trained marketers. So in a way, we're also having to educate the client on like, so this is how, how things work. But it's, it's just, to me, such an interesting uh, problem in our industry that there's so many people that aren't necessarily trained for the role that that they're actually in. 
I, I want to switch gears though and talk a little bit about the brief since that's kind of like our main, you know, uh, remit yeah. is the 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 creative brief. And, you know, we just a couple of weeks ago did an episode where we got one of your videos and we analyzed it and basically agreed 100% with it. <laughs> and this is because it's really one of the debates that Howard and I have been having. It's really the genesis of this podcast. Howard sent me a, a paper that the ANA had put out about creative briefs and how creative briefs should be written jointly by the client and the agency. And I read this, I think it was like an 18 page paper. And I said, Howard, good in theory, terrible in practice. Um, let the client write their brief and then let the agency write its brief based on that partially, but also based on the strategist's own expertise, what the research is showing, other inputs from the popular culture, whatever is going on. Because the, the reality is that client, clients are not prepared. They don't understand the audience of the creative brief. They don't understand what the creative brief is for. So we dissected that video about the difference between the marketing brief or the comm brief and the and the creative brief. So um, I can say we agree. I agreed at least a hundred percent with with what you put in the video. It was just another way of of kind of bringing that argument back up to the surface. But what's what's your views on, on this well, issue, Julian? Just so that you know, I, I lost that argument with Henry, and I conceded to it a long time ago. Uh, so we're, he and I are in simpatico on this. So that we, we did have yeah. a, almost a complete agreement about the difference between the marketing brief and the and the creative brief. But we still want to hear your your thoughts on this. Yeah, so I think that as a as a brand marketer, your skill is in understanding the corporation, understanding the marketing department and what sells within your organization. So when you're thinking about a marketing brief that you're getting signed off, you're thinking about how can I get this through the layers up the corporate ladder to the CMO and maybe the CFO and CEO. As you have both pointed out, that is going the complete wrong direction to who the actual intended audience of a creative brief is, which is the creatives who need to come up with the creative product. Some art director and copywriter sitting in a corner office with a foosball table. Exactly. So <laughs> are they, uh, do they need the same language? Do they talk that, you know, talking to a CFO versus, yeah, the art director, totally different conversations. On top of that, your yeah your audience is completely different business perspective creative you're, you're interested in the consumer and really understanding that being objective third party and understanding what's going to work with consumers what's their what's their problem and that's what we deal with like as as agency strategists our interest is in translating the business problem and business goal into the consumer problem and consumer goal that's what we do. That's what you're paying us the money for and finding the insight, which, you know, my, my version of strategy or, or how I like to articulate strategy is three, two, one, the three, two, one of strategy, which is, should, um, it's got three pieces. Every strategy has problem, goal, solution. There's always two points of view, the business and the consumer point of view, and it should one fit on a single page. And so that's how I always think about strategy. But the two points of view, marketing brand marketer understands the business point of view. They might have the starting of scratchings of understanding the consumer problem, the insight, which the insight to me, how I articulate what an insight is, it's a revelation that shows us a new way around the problem, right? Or it provides us a surprising new solution. It, we find the insight if we need an insight, because sometimes Honestly, a lot of the time the insight comes from the creatives and then it's the solution. And so that's our role. We're doing it. That's what we're doing every single day, living and breathing, writing creative briefs, making creative work. So that's our expertise. Your brand marketer, you've got so much more on your plate than just the one P of promotion of advertising. So and it's, and it's only I, part of it's only part of the one P of promotion, right? Because PR falls in there. Yeah. Yeah, there's a bunch of other stuff that falls into that P. And that's what I try to reinforce the people. Remember, we conflate advertising and marketing all the time. And it and I think that that is a big issue. Advertising yeah. 
is only part of one of the four P's of, of marketing. Yes. Now saying that, I will say that some of the best, the people that I do share, because people, the question you'll often get, I'm sure as well is, do I share the brief with the client first? Me? Never. Ne never. But if, if I am going to share it, I'm going to share it with someone who's been on the other side of the fence, who's worked at agencies, because they understand how the process works. So when I was at Bacardi, my client had worked at Droger and Anomaly. They'd worked there. They understood what a creative brief looked like. They got the sense of it. If they've got that creative button, their creative mind, I'm happy to share the creative brief with them. But if they, they haven't, it's like, like let's just leave that. You, and you, we'll end, up, you end up spending a lot of time litigating the the cross T's and dotted I's of a creative brief when because their clients tend to take them very literally and start yeah. projecting out what the creative work is going to look like based on this one piece of paper. And the truth is there's a magical moment that happens after this piece of paper is given to the creatives that nobody can know where that's going to lead. But in their minds, they're very narrow and they're like, well, this word is wrong. And this thing is, and this, and you're not talking about this other part of it. And so I found that litigating creative briefs with clients is usually a waste of time. Some mm -hmm. clients yes. require you to to share a brief so i give them some version of a brief that that is going to the template that is going to be <laughs> um approved but then when i really get down to the briefing i'm going to give that tailored creative brief to the creatives and you have to really know what you can get away with and what you can and that takes some experience i think but but i i agree completely and that was one of my you know, another point of discussion we've had many times is like, if I can get away without showing the creative brief to clients ahead of time, I will. In fact, normally, and Howard asked them, how do you justify the creative when you go to the presentation? I said, well, you know what? A lot of times part of my creative brief is going to be the strategic setup mm -hmm. for the creative presentation. So I'm, I'm sitting in front of a client and I will say, you know what? You gave us this marketing brief. We took it and internalized it. And we thought about this problem in this way. And here's the creative solution. So there's a role for that brief as kind of a setup. I, I don't show them a document, a, a creative brief, but elements of that creative brief end up um, being set up for the creative presentation, because that's where the th thinking process really begins at the agency is with the strategist. And you have to take them on that journey so that you're not just presenting an idea out of left field. There was a coherent thought process that went from the strategist receiving the comms brief to this is how we internalized it as an agency to this is the creative solution we're now presenting to you. Can I give you a thought? This is going to be a little bit of a tangential thought, but I'd love to hear your opinion on it because I think it's an interesting topic to do with briefing, right? Okay. So, and Howard, I'm interested as being a creative, what you think of this. So I believe one of the most important parts of briefing is not actually the brief, but it's the pre-briefing. So with a pre-briefing, it's I will take three options maybe, or even four options to my creative director. And they're all scraps of paper. Well, back before Zoom, they're scraps of paper and I just kind of hand them to them and say, hey, what are you liking? What are you, what's resonating with you? So I often co-author the brief with the creative director. That's, I've done that for my whole career. One thing that I changed when I went to BBDO. So the problem with BBDO was, we had 38 creative directors. So you walk in there, there is no way when you open that door, you do not know if you're on a new pitch, what creative director do I have? Huh? And what I realized was I saw creative direction along a continuum, right? And on one side of the creative director continuum, and I think everyone's got a little bit of both in them. There's the artist creative director, and so they're the ones who love the craft. They love the conceptual. They love the actual pieces that come out, the TV script. They, they know all the directors. They know everyone. They love, they love being in the editing room, getting it all right. They love the craft, putting it all together. On the other side, 
you've got what I call the detective creative director who loves the bigger conceptual idea, the copywriting and making sure it all connects, the strategy, they're all in that, those pieces. So either side, I've got the artist and I've got the creative, I've got the detective. On one side, the artist, I find that they most of them come from art direction, right? Mm -hmm. So they're usually an art director and have come up that way. This side are usually copywriters because they're used to like fiddling around with different words. And so for me, what I started to realize was I need to work out before I go into that pre-briefing meeting, what type of creative director I'd, I have on my hands, because it actually changed the way I would do my pre-briefing and briefing. So for an, a detective one, which is more your copywriter, they're very conceptual. They will want to be brought in really early. So I'll bring them in. 25%, 50% of the way through because they want to work the strategy. And if you don't bring them in like that, they're, they're going to pick apart your creative brief. The artist, I noticed, they don't mind to be like, they want they a little want bit it, of direction. They want it to like, be delivered to them. Yeah, they're like, why are you giving me all this rationale and all this reasoning behind? Like, there's Tell me way, what I need to do. You got way too much here. Tell me what you need to do. And I think your pre-briefing and maybe even your briefing changes depending on what type of creative director you've got. I think so, that's fascinating. I really do because, uh, you know, at, as I was coming up to the agency world and I was in the business for 26 years, I rarely, I, I rarely had direct connection with the strategist until I was a creative director. And then when I became a creative director, I, I worked for places that didn't have strategists. So I've learned about this relationship between strategists and creative directors as I became a teacher of writing briefs right. and working with Henry, because I like this idea of collaboration. I, I work with marketers. Marketers come to me through the ANA and they want to learn how to write a creative brief, not a marketing brief. They want to know the inside out of creative briefs. How do we talk to creatives? Because they don't have a strategist, if especially if it's an in-house ad agency. Now, some do. Yeah. Some do. Yeah. I've worked at, you know, at Universal Resorts in Orlando and they are, they have a brilliant strategy department and they do some great work and they have completely bought in to the, to the creative brief and strategy process, but others don't. So they want me to teach them how to write a creative brief. So I try to do a balance. I have to walk a fine line between this is what the creatives want. This is what they need. Page one. But you need to have stuff on page two. I literally say page two, which is your KPIs, your objectives, your budget, you know, the deliverables, because these are these are what the what like you said, the trajectory up to the CEO, that's what they want. They expect to see this. But the creatives are not even gonna look at that. So it's a hybrid. And it's a challenge for me to really get into the marketers' heads to have help them understand how a creative thinks. But that's my perspective on this. So I love your delineation the, the, between the, the artist and the, because I'm the copywriter. I am your second the creative detective. director. I was going to yeah. say, Howard is a detective. I think that's, a detective. How got, that's how he got interested in a creative brief and by extension strategy. You, you and have you, to be, yeah. 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 So I, I want to react to it. And you brought up an interesting uh scenario which i hadn't really thought of which I, sh I should have thought about it because my career trajectory has always been in what in the agency world would be considered small agencies you know agencies yeah. of 100 people or less right so uh, the idea of 38 creative directors and it's a roulette wheel which one you're going to be assigned to and you don't have any sort of personal relationship with that person ahead of time is something that's alien to me just simply by the trajectory of my career yeah, where too. I come in, I meet the creative director or creative two or three creative directors that work at the agency and quickly get to know, uh, in Spanish, we have a saying, de que pata cojan, which, which leg they limp on, right? Which, which is basically what is their, their modus operandi. And, but I have observed, right, that there are creative directors that you, as you described, detectives that are more strategic. They're mm -hmm. going to be interrogating the brief more. They're the kind of people that as a strategist, you can spitball with and arrive at something greater. And then there are some that you have to recognize just don't think on that level. 
and you have to bring them something kind of prepackaged and hope they buy it. And if they don't, then you got to go back to the drawing board. Uh, uh, there's a conversation. You never want to come into a briefing without anybody having seen the work. But I've worked along that spectrum of mm. uh, creatives that are more the detective uh, prototype uh, versus, in fact, the one, and it's interesting that you mentioned that it's usually an art director, usually a copywriter. The most strategic creative I've ever worked with on an ongoing basis actually came from the art direction side. But it was a small agency where he also had to think about copy, right? So he was, and he was a very literate person. So it's not a hundred percent thing, but I think that generally you're right. Those, those uh, and, and, stereotypes. And are true and this is a working hypothesis you know like this is a working thought and i love the addition of like big agency small agency because mm -hmm. like I, I agree i think that could be another variable that pushes you you know you small agency well you've had to do it all so you're probably closer to the detective if you're a big agency and you're a new creative director you probably have just twiddled away you haven't had to do all the you know you've had it someone over the top doing it but the thing that I think it comes, the thing that I think is most interesting about it is I am sure you two get asked all the time, what does a great, what does a great brief look like? What does an inspiring creative brief look like? Depends, depends on who you're delivering it to. Yeah, yeah. that's a great, yeah. You know, and, and I like Henry's answer too. He said, I aspire to an inspirational brief, but if I can't get there, I want the, the brief to be clear. Creatives can yeah. work with clarity. And I hear that from creatives all the time. You know, I, I can, the story I like to tell is in the 26 years I worked in the agency world, I remember one brief, which isn't to say that the other briefs were terrible. It's just that this one brief stood out so much that I remember it. It was for Lexus when I was working at Team One in, in El Segundo. It was just a really good brief. So it was inspiring, but it was also clear. And creatives, creatives tell me that all the time. They do sit in on my workshops. I want creatives to be part of the workshop mm. because I want them. We do small group exercises where they collaborate and write a brief together. And I want the creatives in that small group because marketers hear things from creatives. And I, don't, I mean, literally art directors and copywriters, not necessarily creative directors, but they yeah. hear things from the creatives that they wouldn't hear otherwise. It's like, oh, I never thought about it that way. And when, I, we, when they collaborate, they realize I'm taking a little pressure off me because it's just me who writes the brief. A marketer will tell me that all the time. I have to write the brief. I send it out to my colleagues for, for feedback. And then I say, that's that's not collaboration. That's masochism. Because then you got to figure out whose comments take precedence. So, yeah. uh, you know, you're, you're essentially saying the same thing that I'm encountering, but you're talking about an agency environment. I'm talking about, you know, yeah. the, on the client client side. But it, it, it really does make a difference how you approach um, this strategy. Are, are you familiar with uh, Peter Paul Von Wheeler and Matt Davies from betterbriefs.com? They did a, they did yes, a global yes, survey. Yes. They did a yeah. global survey. We had them on our show a few years ago. They did a global survey about, and they asked marketers what they thought about the quality of their briefs. And then they asked creatives or the agencies what they thought about their clients briefs and mm -hmm. the gap of perception was like you know grand canyon yeah, yeah. and one of the one of the slides that stuck stuck out for me was 60 percent of marketers admitted that they used the creative process to figure out the strategy yeah yeah i'll i'll like i'll know why i know i'll like it when i see it is their yeah. basic approach and, and it's so very don't, inefficient they don't um, have a strategy I, I know we're sensitive on on time um right I, I do want to go back, though, to one thing. You mentioned that sometimes you don't put an insight in a brief. And also related to that, we, we talked about inspiring creative briefs. I think one of the things that particularly young strategists put themselves under a lot of pressure is to create like this dramatic, inspiring, creative brief. And that's why I say, listen, shoot for clear. And if you come up with a really brilliant, inspiring idea, great. But that to me isn't the bar. Um, the bar is, can creative work be developed from this strategy that will solve the problem for, for the, the, the client? So uh, I agree. I, I, I don't always put an insight in there because the creatives sometimes do come up with the insight. Um, and I think it's, it's important to, to recognize that. So 
I don't put yourself under that kind of pressure. The mantra that I give in our strategy department here is a uh, solid strategy, spectacular, creative. Like our strategy isn't supposed to be the ad that makes you go goo goo gaga, right? That's, that's the ad. That's the end product. Our, our strategy needs to make sense. It needs mm -hmm. to correctly articulate what the problem is and how we're going to solve it, uh, you know, at a strategic level. And then the creative is the sexy part. Um, if you have a Love sexy that. strategy, that's great, but that's not a requirement. But Julian, as, as we as we wrap up here with our time with you, any closing thoughts or pieces of advice you'd like to to share with our audience? Put you I, on the spot I here. Think, uh, yeah, I think I think we we nailed it there. With I, I that's the first time I've heard solid strategy, spectacular creative, but that's one I'm gonna gonna put in the memory bank and 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 take and and share with the world as well because I think I think that's I come up uh, with something every now and then. <laughs> yeah. More than more yeah. than every now and then. Yeah, it's a gem. But I think for me, it's 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 a working process. This what does a great brief look like? And it's great what you're doing here because we need to talk about it more. And as you can see, there's there's new things evolving all the time. No one has all the answers, and that's why I loved loved hearing this conversation because now it's really made me think. Okay, it's more small, big agencies. That's going to have an impact on your creative director. So these are great discussions and we'll, we'll have to do it again. I've got many, many more thoughts on briefs and creative briefs to share. Uh, so I'd love, lo love to but chat again. We would love to have you back. Thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Julian Cole. We really appreciate you joining us on the Brief Brothers. Good stuff, Henry. Good stuff, Howard. He's Henry Gomez. And he's Howard Eibach. And together we're the Brief Brothers. Till next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.